to your wings. Well, hi, and welcome to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. As Alice said, it's coming to you tonight from West Tawakonee in Texas, while we're on the road traveling. We're continuing on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll finish up tonight with the Beatitudes. And this is our ninth uh, session in this study. And as we've said before, you can find all of the previous studies online here at BibleTalk.com. Uh, which means you can go revisit them or invite others to watch them. We're just blessed that you can join us. It's it's good to have this technology that allows us to reach out across borders into the entire world across the internet. Um, I'm joined this evening, if indeed it's this evening while you're joining us, by Mary Ellen, Diane, and my sweet patootie Alice over here oh, on my right. Hallelujah. Glad to see you. Oh, you can't see. I can't see you, but you can see us. The uh, I, I just want to, before we continue on and finish up with the Beatitudes this evening, I want to say again that I think that the Sermon on the Mount, this is an oversimplification. The Beatitudes is the sermon. And everything else is the commentary on the Beatitudes. And I think you'll see that as we get into it. Uh, but this is Jesus teaching training in how we are to walk in righteousness. So it is incredibly, incredibly important because the Sermon on the Mount is what should be normal Christianity. Amen. All right, as I said, we're picking up, we're finishing up now, we're in the last one, starting at verse 10, Matthew 5, verse 10 to 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus ends the Beatitudes speaking of persecution. And here in the Western world, here in the United States and in, in most of Western Europe, we don't really understand and don't have a real perspective of what persecution is or what's going on around the world. Uh, we're, we're very distracted with our, our lifestyle, our comfort, our activities here. But I, I just want to say something. You know, there was a time, I'm sure many of you have heard of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yes. I, that actually was not the title of the book, by the way. No, it wasn't. No, it was published. He wrote a book that was called The Acts and Monuments. It came to be known as the Book of Martyrs, Fox's Book of Martyrs. When he published this thing, this thing was like 1,800 pages long. It was about the history of the church up until that point. It was written in 1563. That was the first English edition. Wow. All right? So, you know, that's in the late period just before the King James Bible was written. And one of the reasons that the King James was written was because there was so much turmoil in the church. And much of the persecution at that time was between different sex within Christianity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's right after that uh, Reformation, Luther's Reformation. There was so much division. There was so much division, okay? But people back then, Fox's Book of Martyr, I will call it that, mm -hmm. was incredibly popular. The Church of England insisted that it be a, that it be sitting in every cathedral. Wow. People, it was, it was one of the best-selling books of the time. And of course, now, when, you, when we talk about Fox's Book of Martyrs, that's been revised and updated time after time after time. But people were very conscious of persecution back in those days, mm -hmm. unlike we are here in the States. Mm -hmm. And I'll say unlike we are here, because in most of the world, I will promise you, the church is aware of persecution. Yes. All right? So in, in spite of the fact that today... Persecution is probably more widespread than it has been since the first century. As a matter of fact, I mean, just as an aside, um, before Alice and I came here to Texas, we were in Nashville, mm -hmm. and we were at the uh, visited some friends from Israel and at the NRB, National Religious Broadcasters Convention in in Nashville, and one of the speakers there 
actually made the statement and documented the statement that there is more persecution going on right now around the world on Christians mm -hmm. than there has been at any time since the first century. But again, we don't hear that in the States because I think the reason we don't hear it is because we choose not to hear it. All right. So Christians in the world, we tend to be, in the West, we tend to be gleefully unaware of the persecution going on of the sacrifices that are being made by faithful brothers and sisters in the Lord all around the world. Mm -hmm. But it's happened. But Jesus said, blessed are those who have been persecuted. Okay? The first thing that we need to understand here is persecution. What is persecution? Now, there's a lot of strife going on all over the world mm -hmm. that the world would call persecution. But most of that is, is based on either uh, uh, on race, on politics, on nationality, on economic status, all right? Jesus is talking here about people who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, all right? So we're talking about that, not the world's conflict. We live in a world that is filled with hatred because it's rejected God's love. You know, listen, you have to understand this. John wrote, and this is this is New Testament, this is after the death of the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said that we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the power, the sway of the wicked one. That's 1 John 5, 19. Okay, now that's a statement that he made in the first century. We know that this present world, and again, this is New Testament, okay, lies in the power of, of the evil one. We tend to think, well, it's either, it's either in the moment it's lying in the power of the socialists or the communists or the Democrats or the Republicans. Why not something? It's lying in the power of the evil ones. And, and Satan, his focus is, while there may be all this hatred going on in the world, Satan's true focus is on those who are righteous. You could care less about them. Right. And they're off on their own anyhow. I mean, they're just they're going to do it. So his, his focus is on the righteous and on righteousness. If I ask you a question, what's the, how would you define persecution? I mean, that's, you know, everybody says, oh, everybody knows what persecution is. Do you? What, what exactly is persecution? Suffering for the unjustly for your faith. Suffering unjustly for your faith. Okay. I want to give you a definition, and I want you to really think about this. Okay. The persecution that Jesus speaks of is the devil's attempt to remove, either by action or threat of action, the influence of Christians in the world. I say that again. All right. The persecution that we're talking about here, about against righteousness, is the devil's attempt to remove, either by, by an action or by the threat of an action, the influence of Christians in the world. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to stop our influence because we're his only competition. That's why all that other stuff going on in the world, he doesn't care about that because that's just going to happen because it's full of hatred. We are the opposing force. If, if the world is in his power, which I just read to you from Scripture, we're the only threat to Satan on the face of the earth. We're the competition. So he attempts to do this by trying to stop us from living a Christ-imitating, spirit-led life. Mm -hmm. That's all he's got to do. So now how does he do that? I'm going to give you three ways that persecution takes place. By getting us to surrender our commitment to the Lord, drawing us back into the world. Mm -hmm. Now that can happen by threat, right? Or by, by physical action. But he's trying to get us drawn to give up, to surrender. Mm -hmm. Now, remember up here, it said, blessed are you when people say falsely all kinds of evil against you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Satan would do is to discredit us Lies. so that we're perceived as not living that Christ-imitating, spirit-led life. Mm -hmm. So people don't believe that we're living that way. The third way, he just stops us from living. Kill us all. But I said his purpose is to stop our influence. Our influence is Jesus Christ. 
It's not about us. The fact of the matter is, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and he said, but thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Remember that one. He always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Our purpose here on this old blue ball, this planet, is to bring the knowledge of Jesus Christ into every place. Right? And, the Apostle, and the Apostle Paul writes, Do you not know that you are temples of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16 So we bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place, and by our presence... We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're bringing the Holy Spirit into every place. So it's the presence of Jesus Christ or his spirit that always upsets demons. It really isn't about us, at, at least until it's you get... nothing to do with us. It's not us. about us. It, you know, Satan, does he hate us? Absolutely. Because he is just, he is hate. But his bitterness, his true hatred is against Jesus Christ. Now, I can go way into a whole theological thing about why that is, but that's the fact, all right? So, it's because we bring the presence of Christ Jesus that he hates us so much or persecutes us. But it's not about you, at least until you get a reputation for always being with Jesus and being like Jesus. Because then what all he can see then is Jesus. Right, and that's all that the people remember. This is a battle for souls. Right, right. So you know, it, people can see Jesus as in us when we are living that Christ in the pain, right. spirit led life. People can see Jesus Christ. So if you get a reputation for living that life, you're going to get persecuted. Right. You know, remember in the Book of Acts, in the Book of Acts, in uh, chapter 19, there were there was a chief priest. His name was Sceva, and he had seven right. sons. And the seven sons went around trying to cast out demons because they had seen the apostles do this, right? So they tried to cast out this demon. And this demon looks at them and says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? And he just beats them to a pulp. Now that's not persecution. They weren't persecuted for righteousness. They just got in the devil's way. But Paul had a reputation with the demons. Now remember, the demons, these are fallen angels. They knew, they recognized, they knew Jesus Christ. They had been in the presence of Jesus Christ in the heavens before the foundation of the earth. But Paul had a reputation. Imagine, what kind of reputation do you have? Imagine demons. And I see Christians running around afraid of demons all the time. But here, if demons were afraid of Paul. They're walking around. They say, boy, you, you, you run across that Paul, you better watch out. And that is exactly the way it should be. That's exactly the way it should be. So, remember, this is about for the sake of righteousness. It's about, and this is training in righteousness, this Sermon on the Mount. Peter wrote, 1 Peter 3, and he said, 1 Peter 2, I want to read, 1 Peter 2, 20, he said, For what credit is there if when you sin you're harshly treated? You endure it with patience. Mm -hmm. So what if you do what's right and suffer for it? You patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something wrong and you get beat up, honey, that ain't persecution. Mm -hmm. You deserve it. No, I, it, you know, we, we got to get to this place. Not everything is persecution. And we need to understand, I, I say a lot, and it, it, I, I guess it's, uh, you know, our ministry takes us to a lot of different places in the world. And we've seen places where there's real persecution. Mm -hmm. And then I come back to the States and, you know, I see somebody complaining and groaning and mumbling and complaining because somebody laughed at their bumper sticker on their car. You know, I, I hate to think that that's persecution, although it may be enough to stop them from being an effective Christian. That's it. But it's about, you know, if you're doing something wrong and, and you get punished for it, that's not persecution. Peter And Peter writes about this a lot. In the third chapter of 1 Peter, he said this, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation nor be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience, so that in the thing 
in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. So what are you saying? Listen, you'll be vindicated. If Satan comes along and lies about you and slanders you, but you're living that Christ life, Righteous life. imitating spirit-led life, that's going to become evident, and God will vindicate you. All right, so this is about persecution. Uh, I, I don't think it would be unreasonable for me to say that most Christians try to avoid persecution. Well, you try to, anything that's uncomfortable, you don't All want right. to... All right, so let's do, a little, let's do a little talk and study about how to not avoid persecution. How to not avoid it. Yes. All right. I know a little bit about snakes. Now, I grew up in New York City. I didn't know anything about snakes there, but I've been through a lot of survival training when I flew in the Navy. And, uh, Alice and I have lived in the bush, we lived in the jungle in Central America. And one of the things that I came to understand and learn and be taught is that by and large, you leave snakes alone and snakes leave you alone. I mean, I can tell you there were many nights that we would wake up in our camp in the, where we lived in the bush and we'd have snakes and scorpions in our bed. So you, you really learn real quick, either the Word of God is true or you have been from. But the Word of God is true, you know? And we found out that it, if, you, if you don't bother the snakes, they'll typically run from you. Because snakes are smaller than us. And, and most snakes, there are a few exceptions, but most snakes, they're not going to eat me. I'm too big. So they only strike when they feel threatened. Right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. That's Luke 10. So Jesus has said, basically, he's saying, I've given you authority to go out and walk on those serpents. But when you when you step on Satan's tail, trust be, me, be expectant. Be expectant. He's going to strike. But isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Aren't we supposed to be going and walking always in that triumph of Christ Jesus where we are going out, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ into this dark world, bringing the light into the darkness, being the salt of the earth? But you, you know, if you're not, you don't have to go out looking for it. No, no. You have to live. If you're living Christ's life, it'll come it'll to find you. It. Without right. doubt. Right. You With, have to go out looking without for doubt, Jesus. right? That's right. You know, I, I, one of my favorite examples of that, of, of how this works, is David and Goliath. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. And when David, I'm not going to go through the whole story by any means, but, it, you know, it, it's in, in 1 Samuel 17. When David went out onto the battlefield with Goliath, Goliath is, he's a big dude. Mm -hmm. And it says that Goliath disdained him. What that means is, Goliath had absolutely no regard for David whatsoever. Right? He sees this, this kid coming out onto the battlefield. Mm -hmm. He's not even well equipped. He's not even wearing armor. He's coming mm -hmm. out onto the battlefield, right? So it, it says that David goes up to Goliath, and David said to the Philistine, this is 1 Samuel 17, 45. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. It was then that Goliath knew he's in for a fight. And what's really cool, if you go read this, it says he rose and he rose. He'd literally been sitting on the grass. He was so, so unconcerned about David. That he was just sitting down. He's a, a warrior in the midst of all this. Water, and he's sitting on the ground. No concern whatsoever. Until David brings the word. And then. No. We can sit here and talk about persecution. And we need to come to be aware of the fact that we're in a fight. You know what? We need to make the devil aware he's in for a fight. When we're around. Because we're not alone. We travel in the presence of God. But you've got to get to the place where you don't take it personally. And don't be concerned when you're persecuted. Be concerned when you're not. Because if you're not being persecuted, maybe you're just not considered a threat. Maybe the devil is not troubled in the least by you. Now, that doesn't mean you should go out and start you know, looking for fights. You don't, but like Acts is saying, you shouldn't have to. If you are living this life, trouble will find you. 
and you will and you will have the adventures yes, that give you the fullness of life. Adventures. Yes, but you'll also have that victory, that triumph. Oh, that's, that's a truth. So, and, and remember, because remember this passage that we're looking at ends with talking about the prophets of old. You know, this happens with the prophets. Well, what was the job of the prophets? To bring the word of God. What's our word? What's our mission? It's to bring the word of God. But that word of God, you know, you may see it as the, the Bible that sits on your dusty old shelf, or you may, well, I'll tell you why Satan sees it. Because he's a spiritual being. He understands some things spiritually. That word that you bring, that word that is in your heart, that word that's written on the tablets of your heart, is a sword. It's the weapon. And it is a weapon that has constantly defeated Satan through the ages. Look at Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, and how did he deal with that? It is written. It is written. It is written. So when you come like the prophets of old, carrying, bearing the word of God, bringing the word of God into all these situations, Satan understands that he is threatened. I was just thinking about that fact that um, the weapon is something, is the word, and that the word is something that we have to believe in our heart. But if, if we don't believe it, then he could talk you out of, he could oh. talk you into putting that weapon down. Absolutely. He'll, and that's one of the things he'll always do. I mean, you want to know something? This is how it all began. Right. When he turned and said to Eve, did God really he say that? He it's calls down. the word into question. It's doubt, right. So you have to really believe it in your heart. Yes, but I don't, know, just get I don't. I don't know. It's it's one thing. I don't know how to say how do you believe the word of God in your heart. One thing, you know, it's a choice that you make, and then it's a life that you lead. Right. Because as you begin to live a life led by the Spirit of God, remember, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's a light. It's this is what should be directing our lives is the word of God. And as you begin to do that, and you see the reality of the word. You see that God indeed does watch over His word to perform it. Well, and you begin to walk it more and more and more. It was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going. I promise you. Yeah. But they believed it. They believed it. Hallelujah. So, um, this is also a good place for me to make mention of something else that's really, really important. Okay. Persecution takes place at the hands of men. Mm, right. All right. They are the agents of persecution. Right. They are not the authors of persecution. Okay. Our warfare is not, not against, against flesh and blood, and blood right. but against right. powers and principalities. Right. 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 And if you lose sight of this, mm -hmm. you will not be able to deal with these people and love as them. Christ says in the Sermon on the Mount right. when he says, love, love your, your enemies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, right now, so many people being persecuted, just for example, by, by Islam, mm -hmm. right? Well, and that's not alone, by the no, way. No. It is it's most assuredly by all kinds of... But that doesn't mean that, that, it, that these people, that's our enemy. No. They may be the agents of persecution, but they're not the author of persecution. And every time that we're persecuted, we have the opportunity to show them the love of God, the joy of God, the peace of God, the Holy Spirit, the of Holy Spirit. Yeah. and these are the things that can change men's lives. Time doesn't permit me, but I mean, I would love to talk about, for example, the Apostle Paul and Silas being taught, so unjustly treated yes. Yes. and tossed into jail in Philippi after being beaten, un unlawfully by the way, right. Right. and thrown into the deepest, darkest part the of reason. the dungeon. And yet there they are, and they are singing praises to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when God does what God does and shakes the earth and throws open all of the cell doors, the jailer says to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Why would a jailer, a Roman soldier, turn to a prison and say, what do I have to do? You know why? Because he saw something in Paul that he had never seen before. Yeah. The peace of God, the joy of God, the love of God. This is... Our opportunity, you know, it's so basic when you think about it. Persecution is our opportunity to witness. How many of you ever want to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Okay, do you know what the Greek word in the Bible for witness is? Yeah. Martyreo. <laughs> Martyreo. 
martyrs. That is, the, the Greek word that is translated witness throughout the New Testament is martyreo. That's where we get our word martyr. Because to witness is to martyr. The martyr is to witness. Okay. I mean, it's nice to think, well, it's just a matter of going out for a Sunday tea and handing somebody a tract. But it is living, standing fast in faith, trusting in God to be able to deliver you no matter what the situation. Yeah. When people see, you know, when pe people are not surprised. People are not impressed when they see that you can deal with easy situations. Of course. Yeah. Who can? Right. It's when you can deal with the tribulation, the trials. It's when you can deal with the persecution that you, they are seeing something that they don't see anyplace else. And what they are seeing is Jesus Christ. All right. So, let, you, you, uh, you like the promises of God. Let's, get, let's just change it. You, have, you like the promises of God? God watches over his work and for him. Yes. Hallelujah. Somebody like the promises of God. Amen. Let me give you some of the promises of God. Jesus Christ said, Matthew 24, mm -hmm. talking about the last days. These are the last days. Yes. Talking about the last days, he said, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated all by all nations because of my name. Hallelujah. One of the promises of God. In the Gospel of John, he said, Remember the word I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Another one of the wonderful promises of God. Paul, writing to Timothy about those last days, he said, Indeed, all. And by the way, in the Greek, this is a little more, more Greek lesson. Mm -hmm. That word in Greek means all. All. <laughs> all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted in the last days. That is a promise of God. Now, you know, I, I don't say this to scare you, no. but it's the Word of God. And we have to get to the place where we accept the Word of God. Persecution or the avoidance of such persecution is not a matter of faith. One of the things that I hear preached in so many places around the world today is that if you have enough faith, well, then God's going to keep you from having anything bad happen to you. That's a lie from the pits of hell. You know, it says many of the tribulations of the righteous, but he will deliver us from them all. His promise is deliverance from, all right? Not avoidance of. Now, if it was... If it was faith that could keep you from being persecuted, then how do you deal with Stephen, for example, in the book of Acts? Because the Word of God says that he was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, full of grace and power in Acts 6. And yet, he was stoned to death. Did he lack faith? Absolutely not. So, you know, God's promise to you is not that he's going to prevent any of this happening to you. Well, and again, when he tells us these promises, it relates to the scripture that says, don't be surprised at the fire. Fire runs your little comes upon you. So that's what he's giving, yes. yeah. He's giving us these, so that it won't, oh my goodness, what's going on here? But unfortunately, a lot of churches are preaching that if you have enough faith that you're living right, Nothing that these things are going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's just, that's just that's, deceit. That is dangerous because you will be unprepared That's for right. that fiery ordeal right. that comes upon you, and it will take you by surprise, and you won't be able to deal with it. And again, but the thing is, God's promises that you'll be delivered, right? Mm -hmm. Or if, if you don't think about Stephen, how about James, the brother of John? Again, in Acts chapter 12, it talks about he was put to death by Herod. You know why? Because Herod just wanted to mistreat the church. That's what it says. No, nothing else. It's just, you know, it's just, it's like a, a wicked little child just doing evil for the sense of doing evil. Mm -hmm. So he puts James to death. Now, when Herod saw how much that pleased the Jews, he grabbed some more. And he, like, he arrested Peter and put Peter in prison. But the Lord, if you know the story that's in Acts 12, the Lord sends an angel to Peter and busts him out of jail. So, one of the things, by the way, it says that uh, when Peter was in jail, the believers were together in one place praying for him. Maybe that made a difference.
But let me ask you, why do you think, why did the Lord deliver Peter, but not Stephen and James? That's a good question. You think that's a good question? Yeah. Well, good. It's a trick question. Oh. <laughs> All right. And the reason it's a trick question is he didn't deliver Peter and not Stephen and James. He delivered them all, just differently. That's right. Because deliverance is the promise of God. That's right. <laughs> you see, yeah. we think it's all about here on this planet. Exactly. It's all about it's here and now. It's taking us home and taking us out of it, out of oh, yeah. it to a better yeah. place. I mean, That's you totally mentioned okay. So you mentioned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Book of Daniel mm -hmm. in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Right? They are. And this is persecution, right? Yes. The king builds a statue of himself and he says, we're going to blow a trumpet. When I'm doing this trumpet, is blowing everybody fall down and worship my statue. Mm -hmm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, ain't, ain't. this is a paraphrase, mm -hmm. ain't a chance. Mm -hmm. not, going to, not going to happen. So he threatens them. I mean, this is, you know, we read these stories. You understand the horror? He's talking the about horror. throwing them alive into a furnace. And when they still refuse to bow down, he tells his his soldiers, "Heat the furnace up seven times higher." Uh, yeah. to, the, to the the just, extent that the guy that was doing it was burned up right. just from the heat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me just tell you something. You know, you know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response was? We don't know if God's going to deliver us from this, but if He does or He doesn't, He's still God. Mm -hmm. They didn't know whether God would deliver them from the furnace. Or through the furnace, or take waver. them home, they but they waver. didn't waver. Mm -hmm. So they threw the three of them into the fire, and hallelujah, the four of them marched you, around. Doesn't that indicate, even like with um, Stephen, that when when you're presented with this persecution, that God is there to and, give you that strength, to give you that He will absolutely, and then the grace. Because Stephen, I mean, what what was recorded? Remember Paul. Who was Saul of Tarsus at the time yeah, right. was there yeah, right. in agreement. I mean, yeah, yeah. and and you know you can talk about what effect Stephen had. I know from the depths of my soul that it was seeing seeing Stephen's reaction yes. to persecution right. that planted a seed in Paul that came to fruition on a road to Damascus. Because it says that Stephen looked into the heavens and saw the glory of God. And prayed, Father, forgive them, just like Jesus did. Like that Roman soldier that said, he truly was God. The Son of God, yes. Yeah, Son of God. Then that, that Paul had to have that same type of reaction. So, okay. And, and by the way, when, when this happens, you know, some people are going to be persecuted and they're going to fall away. Yes, well, it's I'm not going to see. That's... Have you looked at my notes? No. <laughs> but that's exactly right. You see, it doesn't take Jesus by surprise. No. You know, he told a parable, and this, by the way, is the great parable, because yes. Jesus said, if you don't understand this parable, you'll not understand any parables. Yes. And when he told the parable of the sower and the seed, he said, the one on whom so seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Mm -hmm. Yet, he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now, I, you know, I don't say that with any gladness, but the fact of the matter is, Christ is not taken by surprise, and there are people who will be faced and confronted with persecution, and they will fall away from the faith. I wanted to just ask a quick question on that. I don't want to get off into that right. with the song of the sea. But I would... It's, uh, I was looking at that, and it's been. A, and I keep going back to it. And I look at it, and I, the the rocky, um, the one you just read, like the, the rocky, rocky places. places. Yes. I was thinking, could that be the heart of stone, where well, it can't take root? It. We before we were saved, we had a heart of stone, and there are rocky places that that are not softened. You know, <clears throat> salvation is not so much a process. Salvation is an event. Okay, mm -hmm. but there are people. There are a lot of people that are coming into uh, that appear to have accepted the Lord, mm -hmm. but a lot of times, you know, maybe it's for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. right? Is there a wrong reason to accept Jesus Christ? Yes, no, but there may be a wrong reason for walking down to the altar 
and, and praying. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I've been to places where I've had people, pastors that I've been associated with, you know, say, well, we just offer them food, they'll come and get saved. Yeah, that's right. Well, and, and you know what? And, and he's absolutely right, because that's exactly what happened in John chapter 6. This is what Jesus said. The people that walked away from him, walked away because his teaching, his word was too difficult. But they had come to him originally because they ate the bread and were filled. There are people filling buildings that are called churches around the, the United States, I promise you. And they're there because they, their flesh is attracted to what's happening, not their spirit. You know, salvation comes because Christ is lifted up and men are drawn to him. He's lifted up on the cross. And there is no more horrible picture in the world than Christ lifted up on the cross. And yet, it is the glory of God. So when you're drawn by that, then you're going to be good soil, right? So it, it's, it's not about us. And again, I mean, it's about Satan trying to remove the presence of God. In, in 197 AD, Tertullian, I don't know if you ever heard of Tertullian. He was an early apologist and writer in the, in the Christian church. And he's the one that wrote that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You see, Satan tries to stop the work of God through persecution. Yeah. Right. right. But it can have the opposite effect. Right. 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 You know, this is what God spoke through Isaiah 20, 2,700 years ago. God spoke through Isaiah and said, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. In other words, Satan comes up with a plan, God turns it around. Why? And this is what Paul says. We know that all things work together for good, for yes. those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. No matter what it is that's going on in your life, right. God can make it work for good. Yes, but our perspective has to be right, and our focus has to be right. Remember, listen to this now. This is I, I love this verse. Revelations 12, 10 to 11. It says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, even when faced with death. Satan can, you know, I, I, I don't want to get off on this too much, but it's just, when I had an accident, I, and 20 years ago I was run over by a, or hit by a speeding truck when we were living as missionaries in Central America. And I found it kind of fascinating. I mean, I was pretty well broken up. You get hit by a speeding, I was on foot. You get hit by a speeding truck, you tend to get pretty well broken up. But Christians all around, you know, throughout the states, because people are all around are hearing about this and praying for us, are saying, oh, why did this happen? Was he being bad? Was, you know, what? And you know what my response was? Who cares? I mean, you know, I, I had confidence that I was exactly where I was supposed to be, doing what I was supposed to be doing, when, to be when I was supposed to be doing it. And, you know, God determines our times and the boundaries of our habitation. He's in control. But the fact of the matter is, while I wouldn't want to make a habit out of preaching the gospel this way, mm -hmm. it was that accident and its resulting effect and the testimony that came out of it, what God did, that brought salvation to quite a few people. Quite a few people. But it's still doing it. And it is still doing it, yes. So... You know, it's by the blood of the Lamb mm -hmm. and the word of our testimony. Mm -hmm. And by the way, a testimony is not about what a faithful Christian I was. The testimony was not about what a hard guy I was, that I could, you know, have a truck bounce off. The, the testimony is about the faithfulness of God. That's right. But that's how we overcome. Mm -hmm. Because God is faithful. Yes, is. It's like in the time of Joseph. Remember in the book of Genesis, in the time of Joseph, think of what his brothers did then. You want to talk about unjust. I mean, out of jealousy, they throw him down a well. And then they say, no, let's do something different. They saw him off into slavery. He goes into jail, and all this stuff happens to him. And at the end of it, in Genesis 50, you know what he says? He says when he's confronted with his brothers, he loves his brothers. He forgives his brothers, and he gives them the love of God. 
And he says, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. If we don't have that attitude, we're not going to be overcomers. And God designed us to be overcomers. Yeah. Like that fellow um, from so many years ago, Harold Hill. Harold Hill, he's a... And anything, yeah. with, anything that came against him, any persecution, any tribulation, the, the first thing he'd stop and say is, okay, Lord, what's in this for you? And that should be our attitude. Yeah, yeah. What's in this for you? Yeah. You know, I, I've talked a lot of times, and I mentioned before, like Paul and Silas in the jail in Philippi. You know, if I said to you in Acts chapter 16, this is a story about Paul and this is a story about Silas, I'm, I'm sure that anybody would contradict that statement. But it's not really quite true. Mm. It was a story about the jailer. That's right, yeah. That's right. This was a story about the jailer. You know, it says that our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the, before the foundations of the earth. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you take this and you believe the Word of God, you take it, to, to, and follow it logically, that means that God knew from before the foundations of the earth that that jailer's name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's right. But God had to get somebody in front of him to bring the word. And Paul, listen to me, was willing. That's right. Paul didn't count the cost. Paul was ready to follow Jesus wherever. God used, Satan devised a plan to stop Paul from ministering. That's right. Satan attacked Paul. I'm going to get him in the darkest, deepest dungeon I know. Satan caused Paul to be thrown exactly yeah. where this jailer was who needed to hear right. the word of God. Right. So God the story, orchestrated that whole the story was about the jailer, not about Paul. Right. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to think it's all about us. Right. I know one of my one of the verses I love so dearly. You know, is in a verse that in a in a psalm that everybody knows, Psalm twenty three, right? Mm -hmm. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Mm -hmm. It's about Him. Oh. So we need to see what's going on in our life as an opportunity to show and demonstrate the love of God and the power of God, the faithfulness of God. That's what our life is about. You know, I, I, I'm going to say this, I've said it so many times. I have preached on five different continents, and I've, I've said this over and over and over. I'll walk into churches, and I'll say, how many of you here believe that God wants to bless you just as much as he possibly can right this minute? And without fail, without doubt, every hand in the place will go up, and everybody says, oh, and they get excited. And I tell them each time, you're going to repent of that before I'm through. Because if God wanted to bless us right now as much as he possibly could, mm -hmm. well, then then maybe the Canadians would launch an attack and a nuke would come through this room right now and we would go fizz straight to the throne room of God. Because that's how that's he blesses you as much as he possibly can, is by taking you out of the darkness of this world and into his presence. But he keeps us here because he has purpose for us here. And what is our purpose here? To bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus, to bring the Holy Spirit into every place. But there are there are so many Christians today that think that this earth is going to be changed, that they can change it. Uh, absolutely. It's dominion theology. Absolutely. So where did that come from? I, can I can't tell you where it came from. Well, I mean, I could. I could say I know it comes straight from the pits at all, but I'm trying to be more polite than that. I'll tell you where it doesn't come from. It doesn't come from the Word. <laughs> This is where it doesn't come from. It does not come from the Word of God. So if, that, if that's their belief and that's what their purpose in their life is, they're going to miss out on what God is trying right. to do. And they'll do everything in their power to avoid persecution. Exactly. And, and again, I'm not saying that we should go out and seek persecution. No, no, no. But the fact of the matter is, it's like David. You know, I, as a matter of fact, I think the last time I was here in Tawakini in Texas, I did a Bible study on... Same on, on David and Goliath. Yes, I believe you. And, and I talk about the fact. That, think about David and Goliath. If you know the account in, in Samuel, mm -hmm. that for forty days the people of God are gathered on one side of this valley, the Valley of Elah, mm -hmm. and the Philistines are gathered on the other side, and they're just hollering and shouting at each other like kids in a schoolyard. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until David showed up mm -hmm. that things got exciting. Yeah, right. It wasn't until David showed up that victory happened. So while we're not supposed to be going out looking for the battle, I'm, t 
telling you that if you're walking faithfully in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, the battle is going to find you. And it'll be sorry that it ever did. Mm-hmm. All right. So there's two other things that I want to just make note of, or probably more than that, but I'll say two. Uh, in, the, in these verses, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you. It's amazing to me. How, but how many people can be made spiritually ineffective just by somebody calling them a fanatic? Yes. Yeah. Or saying, oh, you're homophobic. Yeah. Insult. Listen. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. And you don't want to, you don't want to be labeled like that? I want to be labeled that way. I want people to know that I am crazy for Christ and loony for the Lord. I want people to know that I am a fanatic, unrepentant fanatic. By the way, fanatic comes from the, the from a Latin word. The Latin word is phantom. And what it literally meant was inside the temple. This was a name that was applied to people that spent their time inside the temples. So they became called fanaticus. And you know, one of the ways, if I, let me just give you a little Latin lesson here, because this will make it more evident. Have you ever heard the word profane? Mm-hmm. Well, profane meant profane. They were the people outside the temple. So the things that were inside the temple were fanatic, and the things outside were profane. Mm-hmm. I'm radical. Radical mm-hmm. comes from the Latin word for root. We're all supposed to be fanatical. Getting back to the root of our faith. And the root of our faith is Jesus Christ. The root of our faith is right here in the Sermon on the Mount. This is his teaching, his training in what we should be doing to walk in righteousness. We need to get radical. We need to get fanatical. And when somebody comes along and says, oh, you're a radical, you're a fanatical Christian, or you're a religious man. Hallelujah. Just look at him and smile and say, oh, thank you so much. Because Uh, trust me, it's a compliment. It is. It's nothing to be offended. It's nothing to be offended. And, you know, homophobic, that's a word that is like scaring Christians to death today. First of all, the world, Satan wants to destroy our ability to communicate. Homophobic means, literally means, fear of man. That's what it means. A phobia. It's a phobia of of man. I'm not afraid of any man. I'm just going to say that. And my aversion to homosexuality is not based on fear. Other than If I have a fear, it's a fear that those people who are living this lifestyle are going to miss the promises and blessing and eternal life that God offers. Because he said this is wrong. If I have any fear, it's a fear for you, not of you. But how we can be turned off by such a little threat. I mean, when there are Christians who are literally facing the sword day after day in China, in Pakistan, in all the nations of Africa, and you know somebody says, "Oh, you're you know you're you're a fanatic," and we say, "Oh no, I'm sorry." Get over it, mm-hmm. and don't be offended either. You know, I I taught this a thousand times. Mm-hmm. Offense. The Word of God says, Psalm one nineteen, verse one sixty five: "Those who love Thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them." You know why? Because you're dead. Mm-hmm. The Word of God says, and if you've accepted Jesus Christ, your life, you've died, and your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. If you don't believe me, sneak into a funeral home tonight. Don't do this in the daily. Sneak in. Go up to one of those caskets where there's somebody laying in the box and say to them, Oh, you look ugly. Because everybody else walks up and says, Oh, look how natural you are. you kidding me? Let's get real. You walk up and say, You look so ugly. Where did you get that suit? Was that a blue light special? And you want to know something? That person laying in the box is not going to take offense. You no, know because they're dead. And we are supposed to be dead. And when you are truly dead to yourself, those things will be like a bird. And this is what it says in Proverbs. It'll be like a little bird lands on your shoulder and flips right away. You should not. I, I was uh, teaching a group of people in Oxford, in England, last year. And, and somebody came up and they were talking, this woman came up to me and she said, they were talking about, oh, offense, take offense. What should I do when I take offense with these people? Yes, yeah, yeah. When these, I don't know, she said, what should I do when all these people want and they offend me? I said, repent. She, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They're, they're offending me. And I mean, I went through this whole thing. 
If you take offense, what you need to do is repent. You can't control what other people can do, but God expects you because self-control is what God is giving you. God expects you to take control of your own self. All right? The other thing, they'll speak evil against you. That's what it says. Falsely accuse you, right? So this is one of the schemes of the devil. He'll come along and he will accuse you of all kinds of things. This is what he does. That verse I read from Revelation, he is the accuser of the brethren. So if somebody comes along and accuses you and says, oh, you're doing this, let me tell you how you respond to this. First of all, examine yourself and make sure that you're not. Because the possibility exists that you may be. And if you are doing that thing that you're accused of, that ain't the devil, honey, that's the Holy Ghost. So you better repent. If, however, you can check and examine yourself and see that that's a lie, then you know what? Turn the switch off, forget about it entirely. Do not defend yourself. Because if you choose to defend yourself, God's going to say, okay, let's see how you deal with this. We'll make a mess out of it. If, on the other hand, you do what you're supposed to do and cry out, thank you, Lord, for being the defense of my life. Thank you are my defender. Yes. Then he will step in and deal with it. Mm -hmm. All right? Satan is a liar by nature, the father of lies. And so, if we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit on us, that yes. oil of the Holy Spirit, that stuff should just slide right away. But they, and don't defend yourself. Don't even prepare to defend no. yourself. You know, Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, he said, it will lead, when they're accused like this, it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. Right. So make up your mind not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. Mm. And it's true. It's absolutely true. God will give you things. Think of the words of the Son. But thou, O Lord, are shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Don't rely on your own strength. Don't rely on your own resources. Don't defend yourself. Trust in God to defend you. Like I said, if there's any truth in the accusation, repent. All right. You listen, you will be persecuted. Now, that persecution may not be somebody coming up with a sword trying to cut your head off. It may be somebody coming along and lying about you. It may be somebody coming along and saying bad things about you. It may be somebody laughing at your bumper sticker. Is that persecution? Only if you allow it to be. All right? But you will be persecuted. That's what the Word of God says. You will be delivered. That's what the Word of God says. But if you're sinning, can't you be bringing persecution on yourself? No, no, that's, what, that's what I said. Peter talks about this over and over. Mm -hmm. Peter talks about the fact that if you're being punished, or if you're being, if you're being, if, if these things are happening to you because you're doing something wrong, it hey, happens. that's not that's not persecution for the sake of righteousness. Exactly. And what Jesus is talking about persecution. is persecution for the right. sake of that's righteousness. The of sin. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. We're getting down to the wire here. God, time flies when you're having fun. You know, it, it's not possible, and it, it just sounds to me, a lot, it sounds to a lot of people, that we can spend an hour on one verse, and I, 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 I promise you that were we able, I would be able to spend two, three hours on these verses, because there's so much in the Word of God. But Alice quoted a verse before, and I want to just read that one, all right? And this is from, from 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also, at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the sake of Christ, for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Yeah. Spirit and glory of God rests on you. Just like with mm -hmm. Steve, right? Yes. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. The love of God and the deity of Jesus Christ were shown, were revealed at the height, at the epitome of persecution. As he hung on the cross mm -hmm. and said, Father, forgive them. It says in the Gospel of Mark, when the centurion, a pagan, yes. 
when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. The way you respond will either hide Jesus or reveal Jesus. God will give you the power. You don't have to rely on your strength. There's no way, no, the only way you can prepare for this is to walk hand in hand with Jesus Christ and learn to trust Him. It's, that's, it's not, you can't go into Gold's gym no. and, and build your muscles up to get prepared for persecution. No, no. All you can do is learn trust. to walk and love and trust in Jesus Christ. Because He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never fail you. Now, I said before, I, I want to end on this note with this, with this particular study. And I'm not, be careful how you connect the dots here. When Herod killed James, Herod went out immediately and arrested Peter because he thought, oh, the Jews really like this, I'll, I'll do it again. But God sent an angel and took Peter out of that jail. There were people praying for him. The, the body of Christ, the church, had gathered and was diligently praying on behalf of the earth. I want to tell you tonight, because we don't know this so much in the United States, there are thousands of cases right now, and that's not an exaggeration, of faithful brothers and sisters being persecuted around the world. We need to pray for them. We need to be faithful to pray one for another, but to be praying for the persecuted church. Shame on us if we do not. And God will hold us responsible if we do not. The days of persecution are not 2,000 years behind us. There are people on Bible Talk on our website. It has been my practice, you know, maybe once a week or so, to, to name some of the persecutions going on. There's a, there's a brother, a pastor right now, and he's in jail in Tehran, in, in Iran. And his crime, punishable by death, is that he converted from Islam to Christianity. And he refuses, he has been offered over and over the opportunity to walk in that cell. All he has to do is renounce Jesus Christ. So he sits there in that cell, because he will not do that. He needs our prayer. And we need to be praying for him. And so many others like him. Because the time's coming. Yes, here, where we are. Now, we're facing persecution. But the first revelation of the devil in the Bible is he was more subtle than any other creature. Most of the persecution that's taking place here is very, very subtle. But it's happening. And Christians are falling because of it. We need to be praying for one another that we will be faithful, that we will stand strong in the Lord, that we will not give way. We will not allow that devil to overcome us by stopping our testimony, by causing us not to walk in the fullness of life in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It reminds me of the prayer that Arthur prayed when we saw him in Orlando. Yes, Arthur, Alice is talking about Arthur Bird, Arthur. He'll be 100 years old in May, in May and his yes. prayer is, keep me true to the end. To the end. Hallelujah. So, I'm going to pray that right now. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray that you would keep us true. And Lord, that it would be on our hearts to, to, to have compassion on our faithful brothers and sisters. And Lord God, by the power of your Spirit working within us, that we would stand strong and always be faithful to your call in our lives. That we would stand because you have said that the gates of hell will not, will not prevail against your church. And we are that church that he cannot prevail against. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you can turn everything that the devil throws at us to be something that glorifies your name. That is a living testimony of your power, of your love, and of your grace in our lives. I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Well... Next time we're going to pick it up. I've said before that I think that the, the Beatitudes or the sermon 
And the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is commentary. We're going to talk about, we're going to see the transition from how this persecution goes out and affects the world around us. So be with us again on our next time. But until then, may the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of His name. Oh.